Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for jumping in here today and welcome to our second season of Primary Sources. And we are ready to get underway with more essential conversations about our creative process and who we are as creatives. So thanks for joining. And we are about to dive into a remarkable round today. So grateful that you're here. So let's get underway with today's primary sources. As creatives, you know, we go about our days and usually uh, it's a, it becomes a usual course. We, we are on track. We know what we're doing. It's blue skies and straight ahead on the highway of what we're working on, the projects that we do, how we move through our worlds. There's familiarity and there's safety in that. And sometimes even things can get mundane. But we can also step up the pace. We can push forward and move our efforts creatively a little faster, almost with thought or without effort. Um, there's assuredness in our course sometimes. Um, and this really is as a result of what is known. We know it is an established, something that is established or fixed in our mind or memory. Uh, and when we work within the known, um, there's, a, there's an accomplishment there. But then there are times when the conditions change and the road ahead is a little unclear, maybe unfamiliar. There are variables and oftentimes we've got to slow down. <laughs> we have to think differently about how we approach what we're doing and adjust to the various conditions we're in. Uh, we proceed with caution, sometimes not when we don't know what's ahead. And there are signs of warning. There are signs to guide us, to alert us. Sometimes they might seem to limit us, uh, but that's usually part of when there's this sense of uncertainty ahead. And that brings us to the unknown. Something that's not within the range of one's knowledge or experience or understanding. Um, and when it's something outside of our understanding or conditions are somewhat different than what we're used to, we may not necessarily see the way forward very clearly. Um, we might even begin to question our course. Are we on the right path? What, what is it that we, where we're headed? How do we get there? But what if we change our perception of the unknown? And what if we learned to rather than be fearful of it, to embrace it, to take what is ahead of us and to receive it, to gladly, eagerly dive into it and accept it and move forward. What if we literally stepped into the unknown? We do that every day as artists. When we face a blank canvas or a blank page that we need to fill with our expressions, our ideas, and it's really part of the process of who we are as creatives every day. But we still get caught up in this sometimes. And it's important that we must cultivate our capability, our, our willingness to wade deep into these waters and embrace what is unfamiliar. We, we don't do that often enough. And really to be able to reach out to what is unclear on the horizon, what is undefined, what is completely unknown about that horizon. And to really cultivate that within our creativity, through our creativity, to foster the growth of ideas that we formulate as an opportunity to turn these ideas into a fully realized creation, whatever that may be, whether it's a painting, a composition, a new story, a, a project, but the visual stories that we tell. Our guest today is a master at this. He is a director, teller, animator, imagineer, visionary, who began working in uh, the Disney studios on some of our early classics and moved on to directing, writing, and producing so many great classic stories and experiences that we are all familiar with and has worked with some of the top 
companies and industries in these fields. And there's so many exciting things on his horizon. So let's get into it and welcome our guest today, director, producer, and writer, Jerry Reese. Jerry, it is so wonderful to have you here today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mindy. Well, what a wonderful introduction. And uh, I totally relate to all that uh, the unknown and the adventure and uh, the fog and the rain on the windshield is, uh, that's, uh, but then clearing it away and reaching the destination is uh, a big part of, part of my life experience. So uh, thanks for getting that in there. That's Yeah, the magic of what you do. Now, you, we have a large, vast library of incredible visuals uh, to take a look a little, to do a little deeper dive in the many, many things extensively. Oh yeah, I, I sent you the equivalent of five shows worth of deck and... And trust me, <laughs> get through at least a few more beyond today. So stay tuned to, to everybody tuning in. We've got so many great things to explore. So let's get underway. You really, um, as, a, as a young mind, there were several things that were pretty formative in, in kind of steering you on this unknown path of, of where you are today. Let's uh, go back to what uh, creatively sparked you. What got you started into this rather than stand, proceeding through the, the super highway of, of, of career? Um, what got you started with this creative direction that you've, you've gone off into? Well, I, you know, I found myself as, as a kid, really intrigued with uh, storytelling and with sort of capturing bits of that with little sketches and stuff like that. And so as I, as I got into high school, I had already spent a lot of time thinking about very creative things. I played music with my family. And uh, Matt, why don't you bring up uh, something that's just a little preamble about what was going on as I got into, uh, into high school. So during high school, I was doing things like creative writing, um, art. I was, uh, music was a big part of my life. Uh, animation, I was desperately trying to solve that. Uh, I, I took advanced math as an elective in my senior year. I wasn't sure exactly why. And then Fortran computer language in, in the 70s, I, there were two of us that were allowed to go up and study Fortran with the med students uh, from the advanced uh, class. So uh, I wasn't sure how that fit with the rest of my passions, but it intrigued me at the time as kind of a puzzle solving thing. But eventually that packet had been, fast forward by the way, uh, spoiler alert, Tron. Um, but that led to eventually me having a career in Disney feature animation and directing, uh, gosh, over 20, uh, theme park attraction things for the for the Disney parks. So uh, I'll get back to some dominoes along the way that uh, <laughs> that led me there. And I'll, I'll show you the first one, which was, if you go a little forward, yes, Cracker Jacks. <laughs> that definitely dates me. But Cracker Jacks had a prize in every package, and I opened one, and it was a flip book. And uh, that little flip book animation was a uh, fisherman. And he was put his hook down into a little bucket and out of the bucket, he pulled a fish that was way too big to fit in the bucket. And I was captivated as a little kid by the magic of that, the impossibility of what I was seeing him do. And also the fact that I was holding drawings in my hand that looked like they were moving with me manipulating them. And so that the idea of like, I could do that got into my head. And then there were, gosh, over the years, I, I, tried to figure out how to do it. I, you know, I got the Preston Blair book. Um, I fortunately uh, had a situation where there was a, there was a family gathering every Saturday night that would happen and at, at a, a local church. And I was given the responsibility of, of ordering Disney shorts and screening them with a 16 millimeter projector. So I would thread the the uh, projector, which was really fun, opening all the sprockets and stuff. And then I used a rear screen projection thing, which the facility had. And so cartoon parades of Donald Duck shorts and, and beautiful things like Willie the Operatic Whale. And so the short things that I could get my hands on. And I just was in love with the idea of 
going into that fantasy world, but specifically that the characters seemed to be alive and people would laugh with them and they would, they would feel for them and they would, they would cry for them when they were down. I, I mean, really the operatic will, I mean, it was broke people's hearts where they, you know, and what a message it was talking about. The world was not ready for, for his creativity and his ambition to do things other than just be a whale that you would harpoon. And, you know, so there, there were these very touching things that would happen. And, so I determined that I was going to, in some way, be a part of that. You know, when you look at this now, reflecting back, it's, you can see the, the legs going up on the table, how foundational this was for you. Mm -hmm. And really, these were the seeds being planted to get you off in these wonderful horizons and directions that, you know, when, when you it's that's fascinating to me to see and that I, and i have certain memories like there's one that stands out to me still where uh you know we as a family we didn't go to the theater and stuff that my my parents were raised in a culture where that was a worldly thing to do but me getting to show disney shorts that like they figured that they thought disney was a a family friendly safe thing so that that was allowed but not the theater so i i was as a kid i was driving with my family back from a visiting my aunt's house and we had to go over an overpass over another freeway and we were actually on a surface street that would go over an overpass over a freeway and as you came over the top you could see a drive-in theater screen and so you know it's very dramatic as you came up to the top of the hill the theater screen would rise up into your view and it was the scene one night from uh from Pinocchio the whale chase from oh, wow. Pinocchio and, and just it was bigger than life and dramatic and artistic and involving and thrilling and I said dad dad pull over pull over please please so he pulled over and I just watched from the car window I rolled the car window down and watched that scene and Pinocchio winds up after that thrilling thing face down in the water drowned and I'm going oh my gosh what and I just didn't realize even from looking at the shorts just how epic the features were and so I talked my dad into like he was was not used to going to the theater but he okay he gave in and went to the drive-in for the next showing that very night and so we sort of slunk down in the car and then I got to see Pinocchio for the first time and th that just roped me in and I found a an artist that had worked on Pinocchio, his name was Bud Rickard, and he owned an art store in San Bernardino, and he had done background painting for Pinocchio. And yeah. so I, I found him and went and talked to him, and he was looking at the drawings I was trying to do and encouraged me. And so all of that stuff was was very helpful. And then then there was a key moment, and this this changed everything. There was a key moment where I had ordered uh, Acme pegs. And I, I at first just drilled, you know, holes in, in wood and stuff and tried to make my own peg bar and it didn't work well. So I ordered the Acme peg bar and I was doing a little, little scene in animation and they, to order the pre-punched paper was too expensive for us. So I went to the local, uh, the, it was Loma Linda University, uh, the, their media department and they had a industrial strength hole punch. So I could get the cheap unpunched paper and I talked to somebody and they said, oh yeah, you can come use our hole punch. So I would punch the paper there. Well, the supervisor of that department caught me and he was angry. Like, what are you doing in here, kid? And I said, well, I, I just had to punch the paper. It's, you know, it's too expensive for us. And he's like, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? And I said, well, I, I'm trying to do animation. You know, I watched some Disney films and he said, you can't do that. So that was the big declaration from the authority who was in an audiovisual department. The head of the department looked at me as a kid and said, you can't do that. And that was a big declaration. And my mom happened to be, she had driven me there to punch the paper and she was standing at the door and she witnessed this moment where her child was being told, you know, you know your dreams you have? No, <laughs> not that. Cause he's like, you need to have an Oxbury stand and you need to have this, you need to have the camera, you need to have everything perfect. And I said, well, you know, I have a tripod and I tied weights to it and I put a ribbon across so my family doesn't come into the hot set and everything. He's like, I don't know. So uh, anyway, I came back and he caught me another day punching paper months later. So then he was curious and he's like, so you're doing this stuff, huh? Bring, bring something in. 
So the next time I went, I took the little Super 8 movie projector and a piece of white cardboard and I projected uh, animation that I had tried to do the dancing penguins from, from Mary Poppins. So when, when you go into the, that sequence uh, and the penguins, I had seen them on a trip to Disneyland. They had that segment of the penguins showing in an attraction. And so I, I was mesmerized and I tried to do it too, based on seeing that at, at the park. And so he, anyway, he looked at that and boy, did his tune change. He said, now, wait a minute, you, you did that. You didn't trace that, that's your work. And I said, yeah. So he, he said, you know what? I, uh, I was at an event recently and I heard somebody from Disney talking and they said that the veterans are really getting up there in age and they would like to have some young people come in soon enough where they can really act as mentors for a few years and, and get something rolling. Uh, so let me give you a phone number. So he jotted down a phone number and ripped off the paper and said, this is a number to Ed Hansen. He's the production manager of the feature animation department. So if you're interested. So that, the guy who said, you can't do it, gave me the most important phone number of my life. And I called it and it was Ed Anson. And he said, oh yeah, yeah, come bring your portfolio, come on down. So then my dad drove me there and it was the sweetest thing. I asked my mom before she passed a few years ago, I said, do you, you used to take notes about everything. She, she was great. She would do, it was beyond a diary. It was like a law, family log. And, I said, do you have some of that stuff? And so she wrote down and she has the dates that like drove Jerry to Disney for a visit. Like Disney called wanting him to come visit during high school and they asked, they called and asked us whether Jerry was available to come, come in and when the next mm. high school break would be. And, and then the, they're talking about giving him a scholarship on this day and whatever. So, it, so it was a, there's kind of a documentation of all of that stuff. But I, I, you know, I got to meet Eric Larson, who was one of Walt's fabled nine old men. Yeah. And um, so it just went from at home working on it in a town. And, you know, a lot of people were this way back then where, you know, eventually once I got to CalArts, a lot of people were the, the only artist in their town or the only one trying to do animation in their town. Once we were all thrown together, it was like, oh, you know, you're nothing special. All of us want to do it. But at the time, you were the odd man out. You're the, the one kid who was doing it. And it was at a time where, gosh, my grandma was just going to, to my mom and dad, like, he wants to be an artist, an animator. There's, there's no future in that. That's, he's not going to make any money. So, you know, there was a lot of doubt in everything. Uh, but, you know, getting to suddenly be there and yeah. meet Eric. And he just said, well, here's a desk. I was, had just turned 17. She said, here's a desk. This will be where you'll come do your pencil tests and stuff. And, you know, I was in my junior year in high school. And so I had my senior year ahead. So as often as I could take breaks, I would go in and, and I had a desk waiting for me and I would do my pencil tests and stuff. And then they, finally said, as I was about to graduate my senior year, they said, well, would you be interested in this? We're starting a new program. It's going to be called the CalArts Character Animation Program. Jack Hanna is going to be the, the teacher and then a number of other teachers teaching different uh, classes as well. Would you like to be teacher's assistant for year one and be one of the uh, students? And I said, well, yeah, I would love that. But my family couldn't at all afford CalArts. I mean, it wasn't in the cards at all. So they, they huddled a bit and they came back and said, well, you have good grades in high school. You've got state and federal scholarships based on doing good work. And we're going to add, we're going to make up the difference with the Disney scholarship and just get you in. So, so then that changed everything. And for the, for that summer, after I graduated, uh, immediately I went in and just lived in the studio and prepared everything for that first year of CalArts. And I was taking calls from, and I was writing down, okay, Brad Bird and John Musker and all these people that were going to be my fellow classmates. I think I had a photo from that class too. It was, I think the map mm. you want to Yes. <laughs> it's the, the guinea pigs, the famous first year. So uh, I believe this was Harry Sabin's photo. He's bottom left there. Uh, sitting on the floor and, you know, John Musker is bottom right sitting on the floor. I'm right above Harry with the, the white shirt with the embroidery looking all too coy and uh, Lassiter's trying to strangle somebody up in the back. And um, 
Brad Bird is sitting to the right, middle, just above yeah. the, the mustache. And Mike Sedino is smiling right next to him. And uh, yeah. Joe Joanne Cicero, who's, uh, gosh, he's a legendary Imagineer as well as working in animation. So there were, and uh, Doug Leffler, who's uh, amazing. He's, uh, he's head of story at the third floor previous house. He'd work, they do every movie that has any effects in the world. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, yeah, this was our guinea pig, guinea pig class. And so after two years of college, and I, if you go one more, I think it has a picture of how, how I used to look before. I think this is what Zoom meant when it said, it had a little button I could push that said, uh, enhance your appearance. <laughs> I, think, I think it would be that. So. Young anyway, but I, I did not click that button, by the way. I don't know what it does, but. Uh, about how your time at CalArts prepared you for um, stepping into the unknown of your career. I mean, there's a lot of foundational work there. What kinds of, of skills and, and insights and experiences did you gain while there to prepare you for? Uh, it, was, uh, it was so interesting to find uh, kindred spirits because, you know, I, I, all of us, I think, are experienced and we were the lonely, passionate people in our own hometowns. Uh, and, and then to be together, it, there was camaraderie, but also competition. Mm -hmm. And suddenly there were people like, well, I've seen Pinocchio 17 times. And like, 17, that's nothing. I've seen it 25 times. And I can tell you every shot. So there was this <laughs> whole sort of competition going on at some level, but also a huge camaraderie. And there was something that started to spark there um, and I think years later, uh, you know, uh, Annie Leibovitz and Vanity Fair came back to take a photo mm -hmm. in room A113, and it was a Vanity Fair article called The Class That Roared. And there was, there was something that started to really spark with us, where we were all absolutely equally passionate about the golden age of Disney, and not just because it was pretty pictures or something. We, we got the illusion of life thing, and we understood what the veterans had emphasized that the point of all of this is to create characters, who do it, whatever the visual style is. It can be a stick figure or it can be a beautifully rendered thing. It can be quickly done like Dumbo or carefully done like Fantasia. But when you're, when you're done, you should swear that those characters are individuals, not just types, they're individuals who have thoughts and feelings of their own. And because of that, you get caught up in their situation and you feel for them so that bonding can't happen unless you achieve that so when you looked at you were talking about the unknown you look at that stack of blank paper you weren't just trying to achieve something that would move around you were like how can i make it behave in such a way that it will seem to be thinking about things and responding even when it's not talking responding to what somebody else says because of how they feel about it how can its body language show me that it's uncomfortable or show me that it's getting excited even before it says the line. Or it might say a line where the writing is about something enthusiastic, but it's really in its heart disappointed. So its body language is the tell that it's really lying. It's sad while it's saying the happy line. So uh, all of that passion was there in us as fellow students, but equally in, in, in addition to celebrating and looking back, we were thrilled and looking forward. I mean, we piled in a car and went to the Star Wars first screening and we're like, oh my God, George Lucas, Steven Spielberg, Francis Ford Coppola, like, the, like filmmaking is entering a new golden age. And we, we saw that as one thing. We said, when it started, like Walt, when he made Snow White, was not making a babysitter film for kids. He was making a kick-ass, cinematic, bold film for the time. And the stories and the pictures verify that he, you know, he invited a theater full of adults in the evening in a skeptical town to come look at his film. And he peeked through the curtain and saw Clark Gable crying really? at the end of a cartoon. And he went, yes, we did it. We did it. I, I made an adult cry in the dark, when they were, had their alone time in the dark, they cried. Like we, we did it, we made the character come alive. So we said that thing that Walt was doing at the time absolutely belongs in this new dynamic cinema world that's happening through those people. Star Wars, we went, animation will do that 
it will have the lines around the block. It'll have box stuff that breaks $100 million. Um, that is a thing animation will absolutely do in our hands. We, we know it will go there because we'll take that beautiful, epic passion for emotional storytelling and put it in this new framework of new cinema that's being uh, like directors being celebrated as sort of auteurs of specific tone of storytelling, but at the heart of it, story, character, and emotion being the driving force. So, you know, that was pretty crazy in the 70s. A lot of people went, you're crazy, uh, you know, animation breaking $100 million box office lines around the block. It's like, you're crazy. This animation is for kids. And we're like, no, oh, you're wrong. <laughs> so there was a, that sort of thing developed and, and our group of us who were the believers in where it would go, but had to wait and slog through years and years of that not being the case. Yeah. Um, the, the seed formed then, and I think that's why later they looked back and kind of went, you know, that core class and that place, that little windowless crappy room, A113, <laughs> is where a lot of things later that did bloom and did you know, break out and prove the case we were making uh, started in that room and it just had to to wait a long, long time. Well, and you know, there's, talk a little bit about um, the, the need, the process for that. You had the vision for this idea, something out there was on the horizon. You saw the example in Star Wars and what was transitioning in another aspect of the industry. Um, and then it took some time. I mean, is there patience involved? Is it retaining that vision? Because uh, certainly it wasn't an easy start for a number of folks. There were a lot of you know, beginning work on, you transitioned into Disney on Black Cauldron. It didn't go quite as well as you. Actually, I, I, I came in uh, uh, earlier uh, than that. I, I, I came in after, after two years of CalArts, four of us were drafted and became college dropped out, dropouts. So <laughs> me and John Musker Bradford and Doug Leffler were all like pulled away as soon as two years was up. Um, mm -hmm. And something I, 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 should, I should probably mention is during that time, during the college years, um, just to give you an idea of what the veterans at Disney were up against as they tried to innovate and move forward because they, they weren't against that passion. They, they celebrated the passion we were bringing. And when we look forward to the, the vision I just described that we totally got support from the, the nine old men, um, but they were starting to encounter resistance. So there was a visit that Brad Bird and I made, uh, I think his childhood mentor, he made the connection early at Disney, but it was through Milk Call, mine was through Eric Larson. We had both gotten to know Frank and Ollie and we were still college punks. And we went into a visit one day and I got to meet Milt and that was a, that was a delightful, scary, wonderful thing. And he said the sweetest thing at the end, that's another story for another day, but, but it was uh, a wonderful meeting with, with Milt. And then we went, stopped by Frank and Ollie's office and they were still working on the rescuers. They were animating the rescuers. And they were working on a scene where Penny is down in the cave. Uh, the, the tide is sucking her down in, in the hole, uh, in the, the, the reef. And she gets pulled down and is gone for a long time and then she, God, the water gushes out and she gasped for air and it was such a dramatic involving piece. And so Frank and Ollie had Brad and I at the Moviola and they were showing us this with great delight and said, what do you think? What do you think? And we went, oh my gosh, that's so amazing. It's heart pounding and it's involving dramatic, you know, good job, way to go. That's, this has taken me back to like Snow White and Pinocchio stuff. And they said, well, you're probably the last two people are gonna see it. Because Willie Reitherman is like, you know, he's directing this and he said, it's too scary for the kids. And, you know, we, might have to keep, we don't want letters coming into Disney saying, you scared my child. And we went, what are you talking about? And they're like, Pinocchio friggin' drowns. And it's like, you watch Snow White is poisoned. And we went, and they said, well, don't tell us, tell Willie. And we said, we will. So they got on the phone and they called Willie and they sent us up to argue their case. So Brad and I, while we were still in college, were sitting in Willie's office arguing their own history as a reason why he should allow Frank and Ollie to do the dramatic thing, that it was honoring creative good storytelling, but it was also, there were precedents that, that in their own work that were celebrated. Um, so I, 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 I think 
they might have gotten a little bit more of their way. I, I haven't studied exactly how it turned out based on what we saw that day. But so at the time, you had a department where the veterans were still working and, and happy, happy to mentor us. And they were kindred spirits in the, like we're encountering blockages, we're, we're encountering resistance, we're not free to do this. So it wasn't just the young people that were encountering that resistance, the veterans were encountering that resistance. So as we stepped into the studio, even to start, even though we came in after two years of, of CalArts and the rest of our classmates were completing year three and year four before they came across, uh, we knew that we were gonna be up against some resistance to do good things and to do uh, innovative things and to do things that, that our mentors would be proud of, that it wasn't a given that you'd just step in and do it. You'd step in and encounter resistance. So there were things like, and, and you know, you can tell me things you want to explore more or less, but just cliff note is as we started the Fox and the Hound, um, oh, and when I first went in, by the way, I helped with the, with uh, uh, Peach Dragon was, in the final push and so i was doing careful cleanups of scenes where you know elliot was with the kid and stuff where you had to have the combination of the live action and the animation touching and stuff so i helped them through that and then then uh at small was on, uh, on the small one the the uh the christmas featurette and then jumping onto the uh, fox and the hound and as you know as we started the fox and the hound they as they talked about the the reason to do it, the two directors brought us in a room and and it was not a passionate here we go it was it the the basic thing was you know that we could just re release the library every seven years and you know it'd be stuff for the kids to watch and and uh, but you know Ron Miller wants us to make another one so so we're going to do do this one so we all left and we're like, that was the pep talk it was like we have to make another film. We sort of don't have to, but I mean, we, you know, now we have to. So we said, well, we're, we, we don't care. We're, we're gonna be excited about it. We're gonna turn it into something thrilling. So I did a, uh, I was a, allowed to sequence direct a potential opening for the film. And so I had Joe Van Sitters and various other people working with me and we put together a, a finished sequence in uh, storyboards and some pencil test of an opening to the to the film. And we were excited about it and went, if we can help steer the film into this kind of emotional, thrilling stuff. Um, and, it, and it was shot down because it was too emotional. And uh, so again, we encountered that resistance. And uh, you know, it was, and you can tell me at some point if you want me to describe what the sequence was, but it basically was, heartfelt and emotional and that's what they called out as a problem and they wanted to tone it down and be less less involved engaging with people uh, so we we knew stepping in that we had to fight for everything and uh, there was a one clear victory that we had on on the fox and the hound as a group uh, to, and, and by victory I mean and just it's you know uh, in engaging involving cinema versus not. Uh, there was one segment, the bear fight, uh, which, you know, uh, Glenn Keane did a line share of that and John Musker did a lot of work on the, the hunter there. But I, I jumped out of animation and I did key cleanup for Glenn's bear and fox fight stuff because we were so petrified that, you know, Glenn's bold lines could easily be flattened out and made into something that wasn't as passionate as he's intended. So as an animator, I felt like, you know, I could help understand what he was trying to do in the work. But that sequence, um, because some of us jumped on to help it happen and because they had run out of schedule, they didn't have time to come in and say, it's too scary, you can't do that. So, I mean, they just were suddenly were up against the schedule running out. And so uh, we just, there was no time to fiddle with it we cared about it, we dove in, we finished it, they couldn't change it. And that was, we looked at it and went, well, there's an example. That's kind of where we want to head. We weren't able to really achieve it in some of the other stuff, but in, in that sequence, the potential was showing. So we hoped that would 
plant a seed that would get the studio excited about it as a company. Um, it didn't really take root yet. Um, but for us, we just felt like that is too, that is too tantalizing to ignore. And so a number of us started leaving the studio in search of independent places where we could pursue that kind of passion in, in cinema um, outside of Disney. And with, with the blessing of Eric Larson and Frank and Ollie, they, it was sad, but they totally understood that we were leaving, leaving Disney in search of the spirit of Disney. It's because it wasn't there for us at the time. Yeah, that's a big unknown to step into. And, but yet you really embrace that. And uh, I want to make a little bit of a leap to your early work on Tron. Yes, that was, that was right after the Fox and the Hound. Yeah. And so we had that unknown of like what will happen next. And we can't, is, is that, passion going to now ignite something in studio or not but the people were being paid to wait for the next film and cauldron was being developed and uh but people had to wait and so they paid people to wait and i think that one day a week there was an art class and the rest of the time uh people were paid to come in and everybody came in and we socialized and talked and everything but there were a lot of people like my goodness that you know that we wanted to make films together we said, we're being paid, we're here, we're a group of animators, let's make short films. And they said, no, can't do that. So they forbade us doing that. Um, so Brad and I started doing some work at, at home at night and I saw Tron come into the studio and I immediately was like, oh, this is interesting, what's this? So I went up and knocked on their door <laughs> and said, uh, hi, I'm from the animation department and uh, uh, I, I just want to see what's going on. I would love to be part of this. And I think it was that little cog. I think later I found out it was just because in my head, any way that a story can be told is fair game. Um, but there was also that little seed of, I had done Fortran computer language study, and I had thought about computers as little problem solver uh, rituals that were going on. And I thought, I wonder, I wonder if this is something that we could use for stories. Uh, so they they invited me in and and it was it was fun. Bill Croyer and I were at a a reunion at the uh, Grumman's Chinese Theater. They had a screening of Tron in the main theater, and this was a few years ago. Uh, it's amazing how time flies. But it was the theater was filled with people that were dressed up and everything. It was awesome. And he mentioned at the time that Bill and I were two of the people that talked at the at that event. And he started his preamble. I wasn't sure where he was going with it, but he said, you know, we we had developed a Tron outside, we came into Disney and we put out the call to the feature animation department and said, uh, you know, anybody wanna come be part of this brave new adventure? And he said, one, one voice, one person out of that whole department, Jerry. Um, and thinking back on it, I was like, well, yeah, I guess, I guess that's what happened. But, you know, people started to come look over our shoulders and it, Brad totally was intrigued by what we're doing and we, was totally embraced using digital means going forward. John Lasseter came into the trailer and was looking at what uh, Bill and I were up to, and he got very into uh, computer graphics and everything. But um, at the time, it was completely the unknown. And, and we just had to invent every day. We had to figure things out for the first time. Uh, so there were... Examples. Uh, here that we can take a peek at? There were, there were some things, I, like I did pastels. Uh, I, did, I did a number of things. Uh, I, I did uh, storyboards for the actors. So for scenes that they would shoot with the main actors, I, I storyboarded that. But then I, I, the, Bill and I were the only two people that then storyboarded all the stuff that would be purely computer generated. So after doing the, the production boards, then the, the computer graphics choreography was what we were given the title of, and, and there were only two of us that did that. So yeah, I think, I think Matt, we have Matt, the librarian that's scurrying through the, the collection. Uh, I believe if you start with the pastels and they just will play. So I did this series of pastels of how Flynn's bits that have been separated into digital parts would fly into the system and, and uh, go in that beam and be on the, the planet where the, the inner computer planet where uh, Tron would take place. So as you see it settle in here, you'll, you'll see the plates running over the surface and the grids and all of that stuff. And if you take a look at the, 
next thing, you'll see what Abel, Abel and Associates did uh, the final rendering. And so you can see it was, it was quite influenced by the pastel work that I had done. And then if you go forward, you'll see that I was doing storyboards. Um, uh, so I would draw the recognizer crashing into the thing. And, and then I would, in subsequent boards, if you go forward, I would have to map out and have comments about exactly what would happen with effects and the timing of things. Uh, I, there was none of the stuff built. So I would say, well, it's a cylinder that has these raised rectangles on it. And here's sort of how they would map out. And then going forward, I would do like floor plan and elevation of that and have the the path of the object, the recognizer and the camera's path. And then uh, going forward, I would do the, uh, I would do like how far the recognizer and the camera would tilt. And then on the next page, you'll see on the bottom, it was even drawing, there was no such thing in the computer, you take it for granted now, but there's a Bezier curve of slow in and slow out percentages because I didn't want it to be mechanical looking, I wanted it to be organic, but that, that curve, I would just draw by hand indicating the speed of slow in, slow out over time and with degrees of rotation. And then the people doing the math for the scene in the computer would take that as their hand. And then, uh, yeah, there were just, it was fun to do shots where, you know, my storyboard turned into the final thing. And I was very, uh, you know, I did this guy all by hand. It was just a pencil line and rulers uh, for, for his face on the cylinder, which you see in the next frame. And then um, I was very proud of, of storyboarding. I, I tried to make it so that the beam would be behind the kiss that happened in the next scene. So as they're approaching his moment of truth where he's gonna jump, I, I made sure in my storyboards that the beam was like chugging away behind them and highlighted the kiss. So it was, uh, it was fun getting involved with all of that stuff. But so many people were, uh, scared of this new thing, the computers. And, and you know, I, I, later when Lisberger talked about it, who directed Tron, he said something and I, I, I hope it's true. I, I, it may be how he's in, interpreting it now, but, but I want to believe it's a true thing. He said, you know, at that era, people globally were just looking at computers doubtfully. I'm wondering if it was the evil thing that would take over the world and, uh, would it be just the military running computer development and turn into this negative force in the world? And he thought, you know, I'm going to make a film about being inside a computer and what that all means. And we're going to develop computer technology in the real world as we do that. And who's going to develop it? Artists. So I'm going to, I'm going to put a team, an army of artists, who are going to push computer technology right now towards good things, towards creative, positive, artistic things. As we, so the film itself is kind of discussing computers, but behind the scenes, I'm using the artists as a team to push computers as a new technology platform towards the positive. So uh, it was really nice to be part of that effort. And so I, I immediately was like, evangelical futurist and still remain so where I always feel like I'm pushing with small teams of believers like 20 years ahead of where we are now and at the time in 81 I put together uh, a, a plan I called uh, the computer oriented production system COPS you know years later Disney did caps which they won awards for but but Brad and Gary Kurtz, who had just finished Star Wars and Empire Strikes Back, Brad, Gary Kurtz was going to be our angel investor. And I was leaving Disney after Tron to work on the Spirit feature with Brad and with, with Gary as producer. And we were determined to use that computer technology to make this the first digitally filmed animated feature. And we were going to hand draw, scan, digital ink and paint, do like mapping over you know, grid environments with hand painted stuff and everything, uh, which all of that came to be, but this was in 81, 82 that we were, that we were planning to do that. And yeah. just, we couldn't, you know, we couldn't eventually get the, the resources to actually pull it off. But, you know, it's so one of those things, it's, you know, it, it, it's not all that big a reward, but at least you can call each other later and go, Hey, we were right. Yeah. Like, weren't we? And you're like, yeah, we were right. <laughs> 
that speaks to, you know, sometimes as visionary as you can be, it's it sometimes has to take this perfect storm to bring all elements and mind like minds together to to shape the future, to shape the horizon. Um, you your work on Tron uh, again. I I I look at your trajectory here. You're right on course with advancing, kind of combining all of your backgrounds and then a, use, utilizing that to to propel you forward. Um, what were the things that Tron taught you or that you carried with from Tron as you moved on to other projects? Well, one thing that we just realized day to day as we were working with it, that it was this tool. It was, it was another, I mean, it was, it was difficult to work with. You needed the collaborative forces of the people that were pure tech. And when you would sit there and tell them, well, I need you to back the camera up and do more of a telephoto lens because I want to stack the foreground image larger against the background image. You're too close and too wide angle. You know, they wouldn't understand what that meant, but as filmmakers, storytellers, storyboard artists, we exactly knew what that meant. But then there was even no such thing as a mouse back then. And so they had to type instructions and wait. And a half hour later, a new single vector line frame would come up and you've had to have like either doodling sketches or read a book or something while that was going on. But um, we got used to this, the, the, the science and the art needing each other to push forward in, in, into areas that would delight people and you felt a power to this new realm of storytelling. But if the artist stayed separate and the scientist stayed separate, it just couldn't happen. So it was a, a vivid lesson in, in uh, looking for collaborate, collaborative opportunities where they might not be apparent. I mean, those, it, it, I was so glad that Richard Taylor and the, those teams that were working with us were, were just celebrated going into the unknown and with their world too. I mean, they, they didn't know what we were going to do every day. They'd look at the storyboards and go, you want us to do what? And we'd look at things like, well, it needs to be, you know, we need to have the color of the beam, like uh, land on them. And they, well, we can't do that. And um, it, we don't have any way for that to happen. Well, can you make them a little bit translucent at the edge? If you, as he rolls away from you, can you have more translucence? Okay. So then we could put the color behind him and actually see it through his body, but it'll, to the viewer, it'll look like the light's shining on it, but it's actually a trick of it. It's like, okay, we'll do that. And you just find a solution that day and you'd render it and go, okay, it looks like the light's hitting him. We did that. And um, there was a scene where I had storyboarded a dramatic scene where the light cycles have, have uh, escaped from, the, from their grid, game grid, and they're heading to escape and the two recognizers are chasing them. And as the recognizer come to the big wall, the, cycles have gone through a little tunnel and the recognizers have to rebound as if they have med magnetic force. Uh, there was no algorithm written for that. And so I just took cut cutouts and I did stop motion on a down shooter down in the animation department. I just ran downstairs and I did stop motion until it looked like magnetic forces. And I just made a mark for every measurement I did it on a, on a ruler system. And then I just, told them where it was on every frame. It's like, it's at this point on frame one, it's at this point on frame two. When you look at it on the screen, it's CG and it looks like an algorithm for, you know, magnetic force repelling each other, but it was just stop motion. So, but it didn't matter. It's like that, that cheat to accomplish the story thing that was needed that day was right. It's like, you don't wait five years for the algorithm to be figured out. You just do it right then. So when, you, when you're with a group of people who are, a, being very collaborative across forms where it's like, I'm not telling them how to do the computer part. They're the brilliant people. And they're not trying to tell me how to do the filmmaking part. They know that I know what I'm up to there. But then at times we're co-solving things together and, and you're okay with things being rough and spontaneous and the solution now, instead of the approved committee, uh, approved long-term, written in the books as the official approach. It's just winging it. Um, when you get around that group of people, you can really push forward pretty fast. Uh, so it usually happens in smaller groups that are of a, in that frame of mind. And I always look for, look for that. 
Well, it sounds you've carried that through in so many other projects. Um, let's jump to uh, um, and Matt, please shout out if if we've got questions pertaining to any of these projects while we're in the moment here, or we can certainly circle back. But I want to uh, jump ahead to Brave Little Toaster. Um, but we do have a question about Tron. Um, mm -hmm. William's asking if you were involved in Legacy as well, the Tron Legacy. No, I, I wasn't. I, um, I actually did write a proposed sequel story. Uh, the wonderful Mike Bonifer uh, got in touch with me and he tried to play Cupid and he thought that I would be a, a good legacy uh, developer and director. And so I actually did write a, a treatment for a potential story, but uh, but there were other people that were already had the momentum and that were on board. And so I eventually did see it, but I, I had nothing to do with it. Well, you had a lot with defining the, the first part of that or the inspiration that got us there. So. Yeah, and there's still something just about the, the, the rough edges of the first one. And, and granted, you know, we all wish the, the story had, had been more developed, but there were just, things there's something in the just the spirit of it and in some of the raw roughness like there were little in inaccuracies in all the the optical layers that were that were being shot uh many many pa optical passes to get the different colors and glows happening and there was like a little shimmer a little shake and stuff and that was just some of that was just the nature of the process and were quote unquote mistakes like a little little fluctuations that weren't quite accurate but it looked cool. And it's like later you people would want to go back and replicate that. And you're like, well, that was just because it was very manual. It was very handcrafted, even though it was computer world, it was very handcrafted. And so some of that rawness, um, sometimes I miss that in the pristine new work where I, I celebrate a lot of the richness, but sometimes I wish it was a little more felt like it was made out of energy instead of a beautiful leather suit I could put on and wear if I could go to a party in uh, downtown LA, it's like, I wish it was a little more other world and crackling with energy and I didn't, I didn't see the zipper. <laughs> <laughs> well, that therein is to, um, perhaps we will come full circle in our technology to achieve that. I mean, now as textures mm -hmm. and elements are possible, uh, but we, you know, it's a, it's an incredible starting point. And when you look at that film and, and, the approaches, the, the various layers that it took literally and figuratively to make that film happen. You were also on a very incredibly tight time frame where animation is generally explored in a, in a more of a marathon approach, taking past, in some cases several years. Mm -hmm. It's a very short time frame for that film. So a lot of it was, uh, I, I love the taking experts in these entirely separate realms and bringing them together to create something entirely new and and thus breaking open a new an entirely new avenue super highway of how we create animation and other other cinematic and visual storytelling experiences and, and to be on the forefront of that then you stepped into a smaller possibly a little quieter film, but a classic, uh, The Brave Little Toaster, as an independent project that came in. Uh, right, well. Out of the blue. It was, it, it was an interesting, you know, the, the, the unknown, going back to your theme. Uh, we, there was a, just before this, there was a five year push to get Will Eisner's The Spirit off the ground as an animated feature. So if you, you know, it, to a lot of us, I mean, Brad and I actually moved up and lived in Marin County with Gary Kurtz, who was our angel investor. He totally got it. He thought this film noir, big cinema picture that was for mainstream, the, it's for the Spielberg, Lucas Coppola market, not for kids. Um, but not doing anything that would prevent a youngster from seeing it, but, but was not made for them. He believed in it. And so, 
but there, my goodness, uh, Glenn Keane was doing work for us. John Musker was doing work for us. Harry Sabin, Daryl Rooney. They were all, we, we did a trailer of coming attractions working at night and showed it to Gary. So we actually have, it's, it's on, on YouTube somewhere, uh, our trailer of coming attractions for the spirit with our pencil test animation. And Gary saw that and absolutely got it. And we were going to use those digital means that I had had discerned from, you know, chain, using some, but growing out of what I'd learned on Tron into other, other methods digitally, but re completely retaining the animators hand drawn work during that process. And so there was a lot of effort and, and passion and belief. This is one of my acrylic paintings of uh, the spirit and ebony uh, being washed through a sewer actually which is kind of what I felt like after Gary went bankrupt and our five-year effort suddenly was washed away. <laughs> um, so it was in the aftermath of that. And I, and I, it was interesting. I talked at the A113 class that roared photo shoot that, that Annie Leibovitz did. And uh, well, these were some of my, these were some of my uh, pen sketches of the spirit and sans serif in a scene together. And I had so much fun with the blocking of she's, she's playing coy and she's lied to him and she's, she's trying to take a drink. And I made sure that she never gets her drink. And there's always something that where he's taking it out of her hand or she's angry and putting it down. And so I, I did that. And I, you know, people would say, well, why are you doing humans? Humans is just rotoscope. And it, we said, no, but humans are Brahm bones in Ichabod Crane. It's like Milt Call doing this amazing thing that that doesn't look rotoscope. That looks dynamic. So, so I was trying to do these sketches of the characters to free people up and not think about rotoscope, to think about vivid character animation. And, you know, in sharing this with uh, Glenn Keane, he totally got it. And he started doing dynamic sketches of the spirit and our characters, sending them up to us there. And so he, he participated in this as well. But, um, you know, as, as we got near the, the end of that, that process, but when I was doing that shoot with Annie Leibovitz, uh, I was talk talking to Rob Minkoff and he said, you know, there was a whole group of us down south in LA that were hoping this would happen and were waiting for the spirit to take off. And it's like, there was this first wave of people hired out of CalArts and then they kind of shut the doors and said, well, we have our quota. And you guys are working on the spirit with Gary Kurtz. And we thought, my God, you know, Gary just came off American Graffiti Star Wars Empire Strikes Back. Now he's going to do the spirit. Animation, you know, like we're gonna all go do this animation renaissance. Like, what could be better? Um, so, I hadn't realized until I talked to Rob that night um, several years ago that there was that exodus waiting to happen of animators really hoping we'd get it started and then we could hire people and do something really innovative. Um, so, that went away, Gary, because ultimately after five years and Gary was going into bankruptcy with other things going on, believe me, Brad and I weren't charging him enough to cause his bankruptcy. It was, <laughs> it was, it was other things. Yeah. But um, so man, licking our wounds, right? So as soon as I, and, but I just went and resigned. Gary didn't, Gary didn't give me the push. He, he was going through the bankruptcy. I went in and, and said, you, you need, I'll give you one less check to write every week. You, you don't need that pressure right now. Uh, but if, if we get the spirit going, I'm back. Um, but as soon as I was available, Tom Wilhite called. And he had worked with me back in the Tron days. And he had seen me as the animator that left the animation department to come up and work on Tron. And, um, and he had actually talked to me. We had a heart to heart just before I left the studio. He had heard that Brad and I were making the spirit trailer at night and I was getting ready to leave Disney. So he had called me in and said, he was very angry. He said, why, why, should I, why should I keep you here one more day? You're, you're, you're preparing to leave. Is why should I? And I said, well, all the rest of my peers are being paid to sit and wait for the next film. I got very proactive and came up here and I've been giving you my best work every single day and helped you make Tron. And if I'm here for one more week or six more months, every day I'm going to give you that my full passion for what I'm doing here every day. And so even if it's one more day, you got a passionate day. He was like, okay. <laughs> so that's how he left it. Now he's like, sees me out pursuing the spirit. And then when that dies, 
first moment I'm available, he calls me, Pierre, I got this thing. John Lasseter was going to do it at the studio. Um, it was going to be all computer. Uh, you know, he got in trouble. He got fired. Um, people are telling us it's not a feature anyway. They said it's a nice idea for a little short, like Susie the Blue Coop or Willie the Operatic Will or something. That this isn't a feature. Look at the book. That's not a feature. But he said, I believe in the right hands, it could be a feature. And I think you're the right person. And so I have hardly any money to pay you, but I, what I can offer you is I need somebody to develop it because it's not a feature story yet. It needs to turn into that story and to write it and to direct it. And I know you've been dying to do stuff like you were chomping at the bit at the studio. Then you left the studio and you're trying to do it on the spirit. And now that died. So I can give you that now. It's like, this is your baby. I, I won't horn in. The, the one thing I can tell you is I have already have two people on board in the artistic end. Uh, Joe Ramp and Brian McEntee are, are, were in John's team and I would love for you to take them on. I said, oh God, I love them. I would love to work with them. And he said two music people too that are along for this, this ride, David Newman doing the score. And, you know, it was early in David's career. So I listened to his stuff and went, well, I like what I hear, but you couldn't look at a legacy of work yet. Um, and Van Dyke Parks. And I'm like, oh my goodness, legend, worked with the Beach Boys. Mm -hmm. We're going to have Van Dyke Parks? That's kind of amazing. Uh, so he said, other than that, like, go. So, uh, and then I had people getting in touch with me and going, what are you doing? Like, did you go insane? Because like you go from like the spirit, film noir, kick-ass cinema, Spielberg, Coppola, Lucas. And now you're like, you're doing like the Brave Little Toaster, what is that, like kindergarten movie? And I said, no, it's, I'm going to make a good movie. It's, it's my movie. And I'm, I, I can do a story about a Dixie cup and make you care about it. Yeah. And, and I did. I did a little story about a Dixie cup. <laughs> it's like, and and it, would, it would pull up your heartstrings. So uh, I dove into it and it was just, it went from wait, 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 wait for years to suddenly like, oh, you have to have it done now. And everything was accelerated. So I read the book, um, got in a room with Brian and Joe, uh, started putting up index cards. And we had like four weeks. And you're like, that's it. The story has to be redone. And I was looking at some early development art they had. And it's like, oh, there's this, there's this uh, junkyard. So I'm like, well, why is, what is this doing in the middle of the story? Uh, to me, that's the graveyard of appliances. I, I would shove that to the end. And then like, I hate the fact that the, the owner just abandons them. I mean, it really does abandon them. Why is that satisfying to get back together? And then I went, okay, it's a kid, like the adults were there, but the kid was really playing and having fun with the appliances and, um, you know, sticking Play-Doh in the uh, Superman in the toaster. And then the dad would have to repair it because, but the, you know, the kid meant well, whatever. So just, uh, and riding on the vacuum and stuff. So I went, well, if it's a kid that they bonded with, the kid didn't abandon them. It was just the parents went away and the kid had no choice in it. And then you get to see the passage of time with the kid that they loved now being going to college. It helps you see the passage of time. So I went, okay, that's a new thing. Um, and then it was like, what are their personalities? There's just a, an ensemble of characters. We have to get in specific into what they are. So in that same room for those four weeks, it was like, okay, the the blanket is, it used to be a security blanket with the kid, now it's an insecurity blanket. Uh, and have a child's voice do it. And, um, you know, the vacuum, what, what is its function of? Well, it's made to, to hold things inside. And if you do that too long, you have a nervous breakdown. So let's make sure that it is that kind of personality, is kind of keeps things to itself, holds things inside, and then eventually breaks. Uh, and the toaster being warm, of course, yeah. but, other characters sort of seeing themselves reflected in the toaster's chrome so that they all feel some sort of comfortableness because they all feel a bit of themselves reflected back. And I thought, well, that to me means it's kind of a genderless character. And I, you know, Deanna Oliver did the brilliant, eventually I got her to, to do the voice of the toaster. Yep. Voice. She did a brilliant job. Yep. But, you know, I had some people that were, I had some one person actually slam the door and stomp out of my office when I cast a woman in the part of the toaster. <laughs> it's like, oh my God, like the, the, the okay. uh, sacrilege I had done. And I said, well, A, she's brilliant. And B, yeah. 
I think this is a character that, you know, the male characters look at it and think of it as a male, the female characters look at it and think of it as female because they all see their own reflections in the chrome and the flower eventually sees its reflection in the, in the toaster. So, um, so there was the coming up with the, the personality of the characters. And I wound up only using four lines from the book. Um, I had to dive into the writing of it yeah. uh, a few pages at a time because then it's like, oh, we have, to, we have to start now. So I felt like Indiana Jones running away from the giant ball that's kind of rolling at his back. And I was like, okay, I wrote four more pages today and then hand them out to storyboard. It's like, oh, wait, I'm one of the storyboard artists. So I'm handing them part of them to me. So it was Daryl and me and Alex Mann and Joe Ramped storyboarding from those pages and then I, oh we're running out of pages i have to write some more pages and then let's go joe go ahead and, and explore this thing in the thicket and he'd come back with some stuff like oh there's a couple of good lines there great oh there's more good lines there so i went to the direct to the producers at the end and i said you know yes i was the writer but joe contributed enough it's like i want to put his name as co-writer on this project so you know so we uh, went through that whole process and then the casting um but there were, there were things like, for instance, here's an example of the, the not knowing what's ahead, but then finding it be, because of at least, having, at least having the guiding light of the character story and emotion being the guide instead of just doing stuff because it's, it moves or it's funny. Um, we, for the longest time, Joe and I, as we, were, as we were working on this, we would pitch the story to potential investors because we were starting to make it, but we didn't have all the money yet. And by the way, total money, two and a quarter million for a wow. nine minute feature. So we were, you could make three Care Bears movies, four Care Bears movies for what we had. Um, so we would, we would pitch to in potential investors and then we'd come through, we'd take out the storyboards and we'd do all the voices and stuff. And, uh, but we always had a problem with the air conditioner. It's like, he was just kind of angry and didn't have that, like in the way that the other characters, like the Lampy thought he was bright, that he was a little dim. Mm -hmm. Like the, he didn't have that. He didn't have a absolute reason to exist and an absolute personality to find. And just out of having fun, it's like we started doing voices just playing around. And so I forget whether Joe and I did it first, but we started playing with the Nicholson thing when we did the, did the pitch to an investor one day and we're like, Oh, that's funny. So we're like, Hey, let's do it again. So we started doing that and that just suddenly it clicked and I went, Oh my God, who's cooler than Jack. So he's cool. <laughs> air conditioner. Cool. Yeah. And above everybody else. Yep. Lofty. And I thought, well, he is, he's mounted in the wall. That makes him kind of think he's better, but it also makes him separate. He didn't get to bond. He's resentful. The kid never played with him. Went, oh my God, it's finally here. That's it. And I ran and closed the door, locked it, and wrote that entire scene in one sitting. Wow. And then handed out the pages, and I did half the pages and, and storyboards, such as this. <laughs> so that's, that's Blanky hugging the, oh, that's great. hugging the little framed picture of the master that's broken. Um, and the storyboards, we just kept, kept that rough, by the way. And they were smaller than that, and then enlarged them on the Xerox machine we didn't have time didn't have time to make it pretty but that was a like knowing it's not right yeah. finding the seed and then quickly getting it down and then it didn't go to a committee to get reviewed it didn't go to <laughs> any of that there was no big studio it was just us in a broken down building in the edge of hollywood with rats building the plane is your with plane. rats not kidding buying for the bagels in the morning Wow. Um, and that's not an exaggeration. We actually did have rats climb on the table and take the bagels. Uh, so much for the uh, life of Hollywood, right? Right. So, and, and, then, and then there was quickly, okay, voices. Yeah. And recording and bringing in people. And, and so I had some of those pages that I'd written and I was hearing them in my head and then they were performed and I just hated what I heard. And you know, it's I think the impulse of people coming in was, oh, this is this is weird and it's crazy and it's like an appliance talking, so I were trying to do a weird voice, you know, and I just oh, it's like you're like you're making me want to like kill the character. So uh I just was so depressed about that. And I said, you know, I know that what I wrote was better than that sounded. And Joe goes, you know, I'm taking some classes over at the Groundlings Improv Theater. I have some really cool people there. You want to go see some of them? And I said, yeah. So we went and I went and watched them work and they were the opposite. They weren't reaching for 
like crazy exaggerated characters, at least the night that I went, people would hand them crazy situations and their job was to make it relatable and believable. So if somebody said, okay, you're a radish and you're a stock of celery and you're at the bus stop and, but you fall in love before the end of the scene, go. Their thing was, it's, well, it's already crazy. How do I find the part you relate to and believe they fell in love in the middle of that? So they would be searching for the kernel of truth where you go, oh, a radish would feel that way. You know, they were looking for that kind of stuff. So, so I invited them in and then, then it was magic. And like, oh my God, Deanna was the toaster and John Lovett's doing that the radio and he was already doing the, yeah, that's the ticket kind of guy. And uh, so, and he wanted to do like five characters. And I said, John, John, you're the radio. <laughs> so doing a couple of different characters, right? So he, he wound up just doing, doing, doing the radio and then here, here's, oh yes, Deanna did an amazing job. And there was a Timothy E. Day, that, oh, there's a look for you. Uh, and there we are with uh, John, yeah. working with John, and he had all its antics. But uh, Timothy E. Day, the little kid, he was a gift from God. Oh my God! He, we started calling him One Take Timmy. <laughs> he he wanted to know his motivation. Like that, that's a cliche in Hollywood, but he did. It's like, well, what 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 am I feeling here? What what does the character want? What is it? And so in the scene where he cries like he's clutching the, the master's picture at the top of the stair and he, he's sniffling and then he breaks it out, just bawling, crying and falls down the stairs. And people said, well, what did you do? Like hit the kid or something? And I said, no, no, no. He, he very seriously is like, well, you know, what am I feeling? And I said, oh, you're so heartbroken. I, I gave him this whole rundown. And he, he did one take of it. And I said, okay, you're getting there, but it's a lot more than that. So imagine that the engineer that's through two panes of glass and then there's a wall and then there's people walking by on the sidewalk. Those people on the sidewalk can hear you. And he was like, oh. So he, second take, boom, got it. Um, he just was precocious, uh, sounded younger than he was. He was, uh, he sounded like four or five, but he was more like eight, but he was this little guy and so precocious. Um, an absolute gift. And, and th you know, Timothy, Tim Stack, who did the voice of the lamp, I think we might have him next. And um, he was just very much the character. Mm -hmm. He was, you know, a little bit distracted. And uh, Thurl Ravenscroft. Oh, Joe, Joe Ramp. I, I actually cast him in the voice of Elmo St. Peter's, the part shop guy, uh, just because he, I loved the way he was doing it in the pitches. And he was like, are you sure? And I don't really do this. And I said, yeah, well, yes, you do this. Now you do this. So he had been, I, I, you know, he had contributed enough that I pushed his name into co-writer position. He had storyboarded, he was a directing animator and I had him doing a voice. So multiple credits common in, in the work that I do. I love to have people cross out of more than one just job cubicle and get involved with it. So yeah, Joe was completely committed. I, I also did, um, we had people, I think Chuck, oh, oh Phil, Phil Hartman, of course, mm -hmm. um, doing the air conditioner. And he also did the, uh, the Peter Laurie lamp character. And he's so spontaneous, that guy. And then Thurl, Thurl Ravenscroft, of course, the legend. I was so uh, amazed to be able to work with him doing the vacuum voice. Um, so, and, they, you know, they vividly brought it to life, but just one detail they, um, and this could turn into another story, but I'll just give you the cliff notes is John Lovitz got his big break to be on Saturday Night Live. And his agent just called a producer and said, oh, John's gone. Um, and we hadn't recorded anybody yet. And I wasn't finished with the script yet. And so I called John and I said, John, I'm writing this character for you. And you know, please, before you leave. So, so he, uh, he said, oh, you know, okay, I'll see what I can do. And so he came back and he recorded everything for the entire feature in one marathon session. And I fed him all the lines from the other characters. And then he left for Saturday. Well, first I stayed up all night and finished writing the script. 
So it would have not just his lines. You had to, it was an, he was part of an ensemble, so I had to write everybody's lines in order to know what his lines would be. So I did a stay up all night, write, finish writing the script, then one marathon session with him to finish, which is this story in, unto itself. Then he left for Saturday Night Live, and I sat in when I would record ensemble with the rest of the group, and I would do the Lovitz voice. I was so used to being around him that I, yeah, I'd throw in the line and I would do the radio, you know, and so. Dry, it would be kind of like John would do it. Um, so ultimately when it came to time to do the songs, oh, Chuck Richardson, uh, our production manager even pro provided some lines. Um, and I did the voice of the singing radio. So John was gone, so I did all the singing radio stuff. And then Squirrel, hey fellas, come here, look at this. And then I was also the, uh, the megaphone, you know, jailbreak, whoop, whoop. So, so we all pitched in and, and did stuff. And so it was a, a big, crazy adventure. Oh. And we went overseas uh, the, and then the, the, our producers, uh, a couple of them, I had a number of producers, but some of the voices were saying, okay, just send it overseas to finish. You did the prep, you got everything recorded. You did a, you know, you started to put a reel together, send it overseas and I went, no, I'm, I'm going to live with this film every day. So if, the, if it's going overseas, I am too. And 10 of my top people are going too. We're all going with it. And they're like, why would you do that? It's just a film will come back. And we said, well, I don't want just a film to come back. This is our baby. Mm -hmm. I'm making a movie finally. It's like, I couldn't make, I tried to do the new opening to the Fox and the Hound. No, <laughs> it's like I had to sneak the, the dinky animation into the film, which is a different story, but I had to sneak work into the film in order to get it passed. Um, we, we had, you know, Glenn's scene, we all helped that survive, um, you know, saw the promise of doing work on Tron, uh, tried to make it happen on the spirit. It's like, now I'm just going to like send something overseas and have a film come back. I didn't do this for a paycheck. I'm getting paid almost nothing. It's like, I did this because I love storytelling and I love my fellow artists and we are, we care about what we're doing and we want to be proud of it 10 years from now, 20 years from now, we want to be proud of what we did together. I'm going. <laughs> so we, so we actually all did a whole group of us went overseas. Uh, James Wong, the, the head of Cuckoo's Nest was a great collaborator and he let me do a very critical thing. He said, I'm giving you a price break because I want, I know that you and a number of your people are Disney trained and I want my studio to be more competitive and have higher quality. And so I will give you a big price break so you can stay within your budget. Um, if you train my people while you're getting your film done. Um, so as I came in, I said, well, one of the, one of the truths about that is, I, and I know this is painful, but I have to, I have to be blind to your seniority who's been here for 10 years, as opposed to two weeks. If you want to be honest about just quality being the point, I should just know none of that come in and look at all the people and go, I want to put this person in this position, this person in that position. And it might be great responsibility that went to somebody who's been there 15 years or somebody who's been here a week. It's like, I have to break those rules if you're going to really embrace quality being the point. And he agreed. I was shocked, but he said, yes, I will allow that to happen. So there was a whole reshuffling within their studio and it became quite a, quite a thing you know, at the studio as those shifts happened. Of course, there was a lot of buzz and, and a lot of excitement. And, you know, it's, I'm sure there was some angst with some people thinking that they would make a move that didn't happen. But, but it, it was part of quickly improvising to keep it on course. And we, there were some truly talented people there. And we just, every scene, I lived with every scene every day. So uh, uh, went through me into my, my directing animators, out to the, their animators, back to them. They would put scenes every night on the down shooter, which, and, and James had done an amazing thing. He had bought one of the, I think it was the first ever digital down shooter for animation. And so I could retime things. I would, the last thing at night is I would look through the stack of scenes and if I wanted to change keyframe timing or whatever, I could, I could, I could remove a thing or make it last longer or make something last, longer and put a, a note that an extra breakdown pose has to happen here or whatever. And I would put that, bundle that, either approval or change notes and leave that on their desk. So when they get in the first thing in the morning. So every, every single scene we just lived with. And I wound up doing color separations for shadows on the blankie because we ran into a, a problem with that. And then I also 
uh, gave six months of my salary uh, back to the film and Brian McEntee did as well. There was a crisis a couple months in where one of the many producers came over and said, well, you got to send your people home now. We're out of money. And we said, well, I told him, well, no, I can't for two reasons. One is we were all agreed this was a six month stay and that's our film schedule. It's like, no, 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 it's two months. And I said, no, it was six. And we all sublet our homes. There's people living in my apartment. I sublet for six months. You're lying. So I just said a uh, second reason. So first of all, we all arranged for six months and our, we can't go home because there's people sitting in our houses, our apartments. Second thing is we don't have a movie if these people go home. They are critical every day. You have no idea. And, and, and how critical? Mindy, this was, uh, imagine two weeks of your work that you have planned. And I come to you and say, Mindy, you know, the next two weeks done by the end of today. That's, that's the pressure on Kevin Lima and Joe and Daryl, uh, all the people that were there, Rebecca, Randy Cartwright. They all had to produce two weeks of work that they would have done at Disney in one day on our film. So you take those people out of the mix, the movie just is gone if there's no movie. So I just said, look, I, I'm, I will live on the per diem. I'm getting some cash in hand to pay for, for food. And my apartment is being paid for. Any pay beyond that for the whole six months, I relinquish, like give it to the group of artists. Um, Brian McEntee did the same thing. He was art director. Um, so the two of us just gave our entire six months of pay back to the production so we could keep our people on board. So I'm still to this day, six months in the hole on the Brave Little Toaster. Um, Brian finally got reimbursed. He took them to court. Um, I just, and I, and more power to him. And I, I was one of the witnesses to help him make that happen. Um, I just decided to keep looking ahead because there's too many crazy things that have to be solved 20 years from now that I'm trying to get going today. Uh, so I, I didn't look back, but uh, so we wound up with, uh, you know, doing a film that we really cared about and putting a lot into and, and. It really reflects, I think it's still uh, such a fresh film to see it's, it has a, a lovely timelessness about it um, that, and so relatable on a lot of levels. Uh, I think it's generations who grew up with it are now embracing it again. So we, I, maybe we'll explore that in another panel event on its own. Right. Um, well, there are people who, uh, we talked to Deanna and I did a Q and A at uh, Cal State Northridge. And um, we were delighted to hear them talking about rediscovering it in college. Yeah. That they had seen it as kids and then, in the nostalgic sort of sense, wanted to revisit it. And it's like, hey, let's go get a 12 pack and watch beer and watch Brave Little Toaster. And then they said, oh my God, I, we rediscovered it and went, well, this speaks to me as a, as a college student. And I said, well, yeah, because we didn't make it for kids. We were in our early 20, early to mid 20s and we made it for us. And it was, we, we were starving to do something creative and really cared about it and really cared about each other. We were not making a product we weren't trying to sell toys. We weren't trying to do any of that. We were trying to make something creative we would be proud of with the little money and little time we had. And we worked like hell to protect it. And so the vibe you're getting is people in their early 20s making their own thing. So when you're, in, you're rediscovering it in college, it's because that was the primary market we made it for. No, it's, it's such a treasure and well worth revisiting. Um, so many of the films that appear to be a stepping stones in many of our contemporary filmmakers careers really you can see um there's there's that spark that energy that you said that you'd applied to it is very evident so well worth taking another look at i want to uh, jump ahead now to uh sort of your foray into the world of imagineering mm. uh, and uh, I, more specifically looking at back to neverland Okay. Well, and, and that is exactly the next uh, thing to, that happened. So that's it, exactly next in chronological order. So I've just finished the toaster, um, take it to Sundance. We have a screening and they say, the judges come to me 
and they say, and, and this was the year that I, I think the Coen brothers were there with an early movie of theirs and stuff. There was a lot of stuff happening, 88 January, I think. Um, and the judges, a couple of the judges took me aside and they said, we think you have the best movie here this year, but we can't say that because if a cartoon wins the festival, nobody will take it seriously. So we're gonna give it to somebody else, but we just want you to know that secretly, we really think you have the best film here this year. So I was kind of, I guess, thank you. Um, so I was like, God, I gotta at least use Sundance to get it in the theaters somehow. Um, so Skurus Pictures stepped up. They were an art house distributor and they, in LA and a bunch of different major cities in the US, they would do art house films and uh, films with, uh, uh, subtitles, you know, from Italy and stuff like that. And they got it. They said, oh, this is a, this is a college and young adult movie. This is not for kids. So we'll just have the evening art house shows and not worry about matinees or family things at all. So they, I went, great, you get it. And then uh, the Disney Channel, Disney had been one of the investors uh, of number. And so the, the piece of the pie they put in was in exchange for the Disney Channel showings and home video but there was no merchandising or any of that stuff was not, not part of their deal. And so they, we had these really nice reviews that were coming out. Uh, Entertainment Tonight and CNN and on and on were saying like sharper and wittier than anything you'd expect from Disney and made in large part by ex Disney, but sharper than Disney. And it was just like, it was making a comparison that looked really good for the independent group and was kind of, a little bit of uh, casting shade on the, on the Disney operation at the time. Uh, they didn't like that. Specifically, Jeffrey Katzberg did not like that. And so they moved up the date on the Disney Channel to kill our theatrical release. Mm. Um, and that's actually how I got lovely uh, Peter Nichols, who is still my lawyer today. I met at Sundance that year and he, he met me out in the snow with a, in the early years, I think he had a car that he had to sort of tape the door closed because it wouldn't quite close in the cold. And he said, I, you know, I'm a lawyer and getting in touch with the entertainment industry. Do you need a lawyer? And I said, yeah, I actually do. Cause I've got a theatrical distributor that wants to make my, put my film out, but I've got the Disney channel killing it by moving it the date up. And it's like, I, I need to sort it out. And he went, well, that doesn't make any sense. It'll be worth more to Disney if they let it play in the theaters first. So I'll go sort this out. And he, he did, he went and had some meetings and stuff and he came back and said, I've never seen this before, but they're, they, they're going to devalue it in order to own it. <laughs> and so they do not want it to go into the theaters. Um, she said, I, I can't, can't solve that problem for you. But I, I retained his services and still have him today after all these years. Um, so that was, that was the state I was in where I had just had, I was licking my wounds and it was like, instead of coming to a theater near you, it was like maybe coming to a VHS near you. And so I was without a job and didn't know what was next and not looking for a job. I was just kind of licking my wounds and wondering what would happen. And I got a call from Mark Kirkland, who I think a lot of you know have directed, I think the most Simpsons episodes ever, but he was a line producer on a show that uh, Bob Rogers and company was going to do for Disney. And it was for a new theme park they were opening, Disney and Jim Studios, it was being built. I think Eisner and Katzenberg really felt like their reputation was on the line with this new park and they were trying to put their best foot forward with everything. One of the projects was this short film that was a, trying to explain what makes Disney animation special. And after you would see that film, you would then go on a tour of a working animation studio that they were gonna put up in Florida. And you would look through the glass and in the goldfish bowl, you'd see, oh, here's the story department. They're doing storyboards and here's the layout department and here's the, here's the animators working and um, all the way to the camera department. So they'd have all the working departments on display. But the start was what makes Disney animation special, watch the film. Um, and he said, you know, we've been working on this for nine, 10 months. We've even had Frank and Ollie as collaborators, but we just kind of feel like the wind is going out of the sails on, on the project. And I, I just really like your sense of storytelling. And can you come just giving us an opinion? It's like, we just would like some fresh eyes on this. So I said, okay. So I went over and looked at it and, you know, it was, it was well done stuff, but they knew in the past I was, my first, my first paycheck was as a Disney feature animator. I had a part of my life was 
doing that. Um, so they wanted my, my opinion on it. And I, it just, it was all technical. It was like, how many drawings per second? And if you took all the drawings in a feature, it would stack this high and all of all that, the equipment and stuff. And I just said, well, that's not what makes Disney special. And any, any animation company could have the same bragging rights. It's like the, you know, the Disney veterans taught us that it's all about story, character, and emotion. Every department is the story department. You don't pick a color because it's pretty. You pick a color because what does it say about the character's emotional state right now? You do that with props, with costuming, with the acting of the character. So every department is the story department. And I just had a, um, I just had a, a sort of a run-in, as it were, with uh, the director of Plague Dogs. Actually, Tim Burton and I had driven up to meet with him. I think Brad Bird and a few other people were working on Plague Dogs with him. And, uh, he was seeing if we would join forces and we got into a real showdown and it was, it, it was in the guise of him trying to lure us onto the project, but boy, was he like waving poison in front of me. Uh, it was just, he was talking about, Oh, you, you just sit there and you trace the rotoscope book that I have. And I was like, that's not what animators do. <laughs> animators express emotions. They look for the inner essence and, uh, he was really perturbed. He didn't want animators to have opinions or try to act. He wanted them to trace. In fact, if you had less experience, he was more happy with you. So I just said, it's not how you move the drawings. It's how the drawings move the audience. Done. I can't. Uh, good luck to you, but I can't work here. So I left. So I brought that up again. You know, I was in the meeting with Mark Kirkland. And I said, it's not how you move the drawings. It's how the drawings move the audience. That's the essence of what makes Disney special. Every department is the story department. If you do that, I think you have something. So they said, well, why don't we, why don't we get together again in the morning and, and just digest it and see where our thoughts are. So I came in in the morning and I had written up a thing. I said, if I were you, I would cast Robin Williams to be a person that gets to go in and see how animation works. And he is step-by-step step turned into an animated character and sees the colors affect his emotion and sees how shapes and composition make him feel different ways, happier or sadder or more afraid. And it'd be just like a kid in a candy store experiencing this stuff firsthand. I just who better to express that than, than Robin Williams. And, uh, and Bob Rogers said, you know, you know who'd be a good straight man with that? Walter Cronkite. And it's like, bingo, love Walter. Yeah. Grew up watching him. So uh, that Robin Williams that we know and love today for because of his beloved work within animation, that was sort of completely left field he was oh yeah they, they nothing to do with animation yes they, he was just was doing yeah. good morning vietnam was what he was doing Here. so i so two things happen one is bob gets on the phone during that morning meeting so this was only less than 24 hours that i had even seen this stuff and he gets on the phone with uh i believe it was peter schneider's voice i was hearing over the phone and is saying you know this work we've been doing for the last nine, 10 months here. We think we're going to unplug that in here. <laughs> and I'm yelling on the phone. Well, this guy, Jerry Reese. Oh, the fuck is Jerry Reese? <laughs> so, like, uh, well, he used to be an animator that whatever. So after different sort of yellings and things going on, Bob hangs up and goes, well, you've got four weeks to get something ready to show Peter. And then if it passes Peter, then you've got another three weeks to show it to Katzberg. And I went, well, what are you, what are you talking about? You asked me to come here and give an opinion and be fresh eyes. And they went, oh, you have to direct this. So it turned, it just, they shoved me into the director's chair. I did not see that coming. I wasn't there to get a job. It was just, I was licking my wounds from toaster. It had, to, to my mind, had died <laughs> at least a partial death, if not a full death. And uh, although I, I was delighted to see over the years that people discovered it and grew to bond with it. And so I celebrate that now. But at the time, I saw it as this terrible, terrible loss. And to suddenly be just, uh, and, and I was speaking out of passion. It was like, that's not what Disney's about. This is what Disney's about. You should do this, blah, 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 blah. passion, passion. And they're like, do it. Here's the director's share. Go. So suddenly pushed into that. Second thing that happened is as soon as I suggested Robin, which Bob and Mark and, and their whole company was into that. Katzenberg was like, nope, not Robin Williams, not getting him anywhere near Disney feature animation, you know, the Bible Belt and all that. We have a lot of people out there. I don't want letters coming in. He's a crotch grabbing adult comic with substance abuse problems. 
And uh, I know you want to make a Jerry Reese thing, but this is, uh, you know, we're not going to let this, our animation be derailed into that kind of territory. So I said, okay, do you think Pinocchio was a charming film? I said, yes. So you think that's like a nice, charming, family-friendly thing? Yes. Do you know who played Jiminy Cricket? It was a guy named Cliff Edwards. And I think, Matt, you have a picture of him. Cliff Edwards played the role of Jiminy Cricket. And his stage name was Ukulele Ike. And he worked blue. So you could go see him do Jiminy Cricket in Pinocchio. And then after the movie, get a babysitter and go to a, a club and watch the voice of Jiminy Cricket tell dirty jokes and sing dirty songs and stuff. He was uh, quite a, a, um, a, a blue working uh, vaudevillian performer. Yeah. And he had substance abuse problems. And, you know, eventually he died as an alcoholic and it was a very sad situation. So, so anyway. Um, Gives such a, a resounding performance as Jiminy Cricket. In yeah, and so I just said, I, you know, Walt saw the gift that he had, and I, I think we all see the gift that Robin has. Mm -hmm. And I would not be afraid of it in the same way that Walt was not, Walt didn't shy away from Cliff yeah. because of that in those days. And we're all thankful for it. And I, I, I swear to you, Robin is the right choice. So he begrudgingly said, okay, just because, because it's a short and it's in the parks, it's not in the theaters for the families to go to in the traditional way. It, this can be kind of an experiment, but I wouldn't let him anywhere near feature animation. Um, so then, you know, going forward, uh, you know, the, the rest happened. Uh, we got Walter and Robin, uh, just cliff notes. They, they had never met before, but they were very intrigued with each other. Um, there's fun stories about that, but they, they wound up having a friendship that lasted beyond the, the film. They got together with their families for dinner after that for, for years. So that was nice to see that bloom. And what do you know, um, you know, the whole thing played well with the crowd. Robin was a delight to work with. Uh, everybody at Disney, Roy Disney got involved with it. And um, they all, everybody really stepped up and began to really care about what was happening in this little film because they saw so much of, uh, I mean, it, it was taking the step saying, this is the essence of Disney magic. Um, and so of course, uh, you know, who would take that more personally than Roy Disney? Um, we got a Kendall O'Connor out of retirement mm -hmm. and he did uh, color styling for that film. He had also done it for the Brave Little Toaster as well. So mm -hmm. uh, color styling throughout the whole project. And um, we just, uh, built giant sets back at the time you couldn't do uh, composites and things so we, uh, we actually built our huge sets for them to play in and uh, you know it came out and people really enjoyed the film and Robin was beloved by the audience thankfully and it, you know I knew in my heart that that would happen but instead of them saying oh it's crotch grabbing adult comic with, with substance abuse problems they would just say oh it's robin and oh look he's turning into a little lost boy and no he's flying away with peter pan and it was just they their hearts were caught up in it and in the same way that i you know i i really felt like our collection of artists on toaster had brought a sort of a, a charm and a warmth to it um where they aren't just making a product product they're making something they care about it and i felt like some of their personal warmth came into it and i really felt like robin and walter they weren't just there to do a gig they weren't like dry uninterested professionals they were really intrigued and excited to be doing it and did their homework and uh were were so friendly and engaging and wonderful and uh and i also by the way i just have to give huge credit to corey burton who did temp voices for Robin and Walter for me. So when I showed my story reels to Katzenberg and to Eisner, it was amazing voice artist Corey Burton that had, had done Robin and Walter um, for that. And, and, and Eisner thought I had really gotten Robin and Walter. He said, oh, when did you, when did you get them to uh, do the voice of your track? That's great. So I called Corey and I went, you just fooled Eisner. He thought that was really Robin and Walter. And, the, when I first got Robin and Walter on the set, I played that reel for them and uh, they watched it through. I just said, just to give you an idea of when it's all together, what it'll be. And it finishes and Cronkite turns to Robin and goes, what do they need us for? <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, so I told Corey that too, and he loved that. Uh, so but, it, it really, I think, brought about some other remarkable advances. You, not only was this such a memorable experience, but um, it changed a few opinions about possible. <laughs> yes, and, and there, I have an image of uh, uh, Robin in Aladdin, uh, and there's a particular scene when he gets his freedom where he is dressed as the tourist uh, that he was in live action when he stepped out of uh, our film. And uh, I Matt, I think you can find that. It's a comparison, split screen comparison of uh, live action Robin on the left and animated Robin as the genie on the right. But basically, uh, John Musker and Ron Clements, in, uh, they were trying to figure out how, who to cast in Aladdin. And they saw this film. And in this film, uh, there's a major scene where once Robin is turned into an animated character in our scene where he's, first he's going tagging along with Walter as live action his, himself. Then he gets turned into only a voice. Then it's because they explain, well, that's the process. Next we capture a voice. Then he gets turned into an animated character and Bruce Smith is at the desk animating him. And he says, hey, animator, what can we do? And he says, he can do it. You can do anything he can draw. Hey, animator, let's have some fun, huh? And he goes into a big metamorphosis scene. And so I let Robin improvise for like a half hour. And sadly, I had to cut that down into like 30 seconds from a half hour of just gems, but I could have made it much longer. But you know, we had to end the film sometime. But it was a metamorphosis scene with Robin improvising. And then at the end of it, when he turns in uh, back into himself, he says, oh, I always wanted to do that. And then he goes on with the adventure. So that film where it's just Robin improving and metamorphosizing through all these different states, um, made John and Ron go, genie, a genie changing and onto these different forms, that could be the ticket. Um, so uh, my wife, Rebecca Reese, was part of the uh, Aladdin story team. And they talked to her and said, wow, you know, Robin is very intriguing. What was it like for Jerry to work with him? I mean, was Robin a loose cannon or was he okay to work with and everything? And she said, oh, they had a great time. You should talk to Jerry about it. So um, anyway, they, you know, the next domino that fell is instead of Robin being for bad from getting anywhere near animation, he was invited in to be the genie. And I think that really set a different tone of what very much. kind of filmmaking happened. And um, John and Ron, invited a number of us who had, who had made Back to Neverland to the premiere of their film. And they said, hey, look, for, we put a permanent tip of the hat to your short film because it never would have been this movie without your film preceding it. Um, and we put a permanent thank you in our, in our feature. And so, you know, we started watching and for the first 10 minutes, I'm looking for it, looking for it. And then I finally gave up. I just got caught up in their story. And at the end, when the genie gets his freedom, and he's off traveling through space-time continuing. You don't know where he's going, but he pops back looking different ways. One of the times he pops back, he's wearing, as you can see, the same outfit yeah, as the genie, as uh, Robin himself wore in live action when he stepped out of the crowd, one of the tourists in, in the film. So that was just a nice little thing. And then that, this, by the way, started my whole adventure. And I'm, I think I'm 21 shows into the theme park yeah. world now as part of my part of my adventure and uh, uh, but that finally I was in the theme parks and by the time this park opened where this was opening I actually had four other shows that I was opening on the same day so it turned into a feast or famine thing it was from went from famine after toaster to feast suddenly and but but um, again you know you talk about the known and the unknown they it wasn't like it's like that project itself, I didn't expect to show up. When it did, they didn't say, oh, here's a charming film. We would just want you to participate in it. They said, here's a problem. We think it isn't working. What would you do instead? So it wasn't like, oh, here's things on a silver platter. It's like, here's a problem. We're putting a problem in your lap. And when we were done, we went, oh, we all had fun and we did a good thing. But you know, you had to be problem solver was a big part of what you were tasked to do, which is it's, it's flattering to be asked into that position, but it's not, you never trust that it will happen because you don't know where you're going to find the solution. It's not, it's not a given ever. And so you're always working really hard to go, okay, they used me as the butter buzzer beater last time. It's like, hey, you know, it's in the NBA. 
it's like there's 2.3 seconds left we're going to throw you the ball it's like you know if you get the buzzer beater good if you don't bad so all the pressure is always on and the next ones that came my yeah. way were the same thing it's like jeff is like hey jerry i'm gonna send you over a videotape it's a, it's a we effing um, he didn't say effing we effing hate it it's like so we went up and shot this thing with george lucas and <laughs> effing hate it um take a look at it tell me what's wrong call me back so i call him back it's like well I think this is a problem. Instead, I would do this to make it more clear. I would bring Anthony Daniels in. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, write it tomorrow and Thursday and go shoot it on Friday. Click. So there was a lot of that. Problem solver. And, and yet it is applying all the skills, all the talents, all the experience uh, to be able to instantaneously make that leap into the unknown and produce, to create. Yeah. And the thing that you're grasping for in that is not just to survive because the people that did the last one were just surviving and making it you're going like what is that kernel of the charming magical extra thing that will make people want to go back and see it a second time like what's the smile what's the heart what's the the secret sauce and you search for that and if you can find that you go okay that's where we're going and there might be any number of problems thrown in our way but as long as we get there I'm, I'm okay with duct tape being part of how we get, get there. Uh, Keep this journey going because you have such an incredibly rich, uh, it, it, we're not even halfway through your amazing <laughs> creative travels and, and stepping into your, you know, 21 attractions within Imagineering and theme park experiences that have redefined and reshaped and pushed boundaries there. Um, so we have a lot to cover, but I see we have some questions, Matt. Oh, good. Uh, things coming through. So let's, let's. Yeah. Uh, well, I want to address this question from the chat, which is asking if any of these films that you've made, uh, these short films, are they available online anywhere? Um, gosh, there's bootlegs of things um, that are out. I always cringe. I wish we could just put out, you know, pristine copies, but some things, some things you had to experience in the in the park. There were, you know, there were projects that were like, well, Back to Neverland could be experienced as a movie. It's, it's it is a movie, but there were things where, like Creative Command, which was predecessor to Inside Out, um, and actually, you know, uh, we actually had some of the some of the staff that wound up on Inside Out working with us in the animation department. Uh, we were doing that, but that's eight screens and two audio animatronic figures and in-room effects. So if you see that, you have to kind of see somebody's videotape of the whole room. It's not just a Spirit. film you can watch. And there were a number of other things like that, like Mystic Manor. It's a ride through thing. And there's, there's parts that I directed all throughout, but you have to immersively go through it in order to experience it. And, uh, you know, that's just, a, just a quickly, that was another example where there were years of hard work and, and beautiful development that went into it, but then the powers that be hit the pause button and said, this is a huge, giant, expensive thing we're about to build. Are we sure it warrants the money being spent? We, ha we have to take a look at our climactic scenes and feel confident in that to go forward. So then they gave me the call and was like, we want you to take a look and make sure that we're doing justice to the magic blooming and because we want to know we're spending our money for something that is going to be magical damn it so uh so there was that again it's like the do we have the solution can you solve the problem will you be the buzzer beater so um and and it was the sweetest thing david katzman who's a wonderful creative executive over this said we want to send you to a creative cave and have you bring back something? And I hadn't heard it called the Creative Cave before. I thought that was rather cute. So they would put up with me like going and uh, like sequestering at, at home. And this was before the pandemic. But I would go into my Creative Cave and I would make stuff and take back. Well, here's here's a preview of what I think it would be. And thankfully, it did you know do the magic for them. And then they unpaused it, went into production, and uh, we wound up doing that. But that is something where you can't just see see a film. Uh, although people have posted ride throughs on <laughs> video with uh, getting better and better at like nice HD or even, uh, you know, 4k 
resolution home videos that are up. And I, I'm very glad that the park isn't trying to take them all down. It's, I'm glad they're doing more of that. But um, so some of them are available in that form and occasionally like Back to Neverland as bootlegs of various quality and I always cringe. But, <laughs> It's got to be a little frustrating, but yet still rewarding um, to not be able to tangibly hold up a DVD or here's the end result, but see it in the, I guess, perhaps see it in the eyes of the ex people who experience it. You know, there, there was some, um, there, uh, there's a brilliant artist that I've worked with a couple times, Tim Landry, and he, he went over and was de dealing with the install of, of uh, Mystic Manor. And, and I had done a lot of the visual elements, the, the fresco and the, you know, the, the, the mosaic uh, Medusa I had designed, like the shape of every tile of that so that it would work and stuff. But then there were people that had to go implement my artwork and, and timing and stuff into, into the show. And Tim had gone over there to, to be present during a lot of the install and then I, you know, reviewed when things were done and he, he was going to send back a pristine ride through thing, which he was shooting or he was behind the scenes. He was one of the people that created it. He was going to take this documentary thing. And then he just said, Oh, I found this, these two girls rode through and put their video on. And it's, this is way more fun because their, their participation is exactly what we hoped would happen. And they're like, they're calling out things to Albert, the little mischievous monkey. They're like, come on. Albert, Albert, what are you doing? Stop, put that down. And he was like, that's, that's why we do it. Watch their video. <laughs> yeah, and you know, the, the experience of it, that's difficult to capture. And I know you yeah. are on the forefront of experiential entertainment. And I, unfortunately with time limits, I think we're gonna have to, and I'm so excited, we will save that for future primary sources adventures with you. Um, I want to get to, there are a couple more questions here hmm. in the chat. I want to make sure we get those uh, answered. Yeah, I'm going to jump to this question because I feel like it's a little bit relevant to our current conversation. Um, a little bit yeah. relevant is a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm asking, do you feel, uh, do you ever feel like you're a bit too far ahead of the curve when you see projects getting acclimation based on ideas you brought to earlier projects, such as Inside Out, in Cranium Command or the Genie and back to Neverland? You know, I, 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 I understand what you're saying and it, it's, it, it's a blessing and a curse and there's, there are parts of it that are frustrating, but, but I also feel like, you know, in the case of the, the caps, the cop system that I drew up versus the cap system that happened at Disney and it's like history kind of puts it in one place and, you know, a few people behind the scenes know it started earlier with something else. And, you know, there, there are times where you're frustrated and you go, gee, I wish the history books were, would acknowledge more the behind the scenes chronology rather than just huh? the, the public <laughs> stuff. But um, there's other times where I feel like, you know, it's inevitable anyway. And it's just teams of people that see what's out there 20 years that you just, and we talk about it occasionally where it's, you go from uh, you're crazy to, well, it might be done to, you know, that's plausible to it's inevitable, of course. And then it's like, what are you talking about it for? Of course. It's like, well, 20 years ago, you didn't say that to me. Um, but in, and then in some other cases, to me, there's a direct cause and effect. Um, you know, like back to Neverland leading to Robin being cast in Aladdin. There was a, even though we were the, you know, the, the smaller, you know, the, the smaller production that didn't get as much splash and enough coverage and you know it, the Disney marketing department didn't say you know from the makers of back to Neverland you know the guess is like we never got mentioned except uh I was so happy and uh, you know that John and Ron were completely comfortable they you know I had a I had a a writer come up to me and he said, oh, I was just writing a book and writing about stuff that John and Ron are doing. And he said, by the way, they told me that, that you know, they cast Robin and Aladdin because of your film Back to Neverland. So, you know, so behind my back, they were telling the truth about sort of where the idea was, was born. And in cases like that, I feel like even if it's just those of us behind the scenes uh, talking about just the culture of creativity that we have, you know, I, I'm, I'm happy to be out 
poking around on the cutting edge and occasionally making a difference. Sometimes it's a difference that there's, there's no sort of direct cause and effect. Other times it really leads to things or leads to at least partially something happening and then eventually it happens. And, you know, I just, I, I, I greatly prefer that and the, the unknown path of that to the, what some people would find comfort of being in a staff position and doing what's put in front of me every day. And I, you know, I, uh, I, I have done that for short periods of time and I and it had a, a great time doing it at, um, that imaginary at the R&D department uh, had a, a beautiful experience for the last five years as an executive R&D imagineer. And I, John Snotty, the head of that department, brought me in to be sort of the, the guardian of story, character, and emotion in this bleeding cutting edge, you know, stacks of PhDs doing the, the blooming of all kinds of science from all over the world. And these are hand-picked people from all over the globe. Uh, so it's really rarefied air you're in. And to be in that group of people, you know, hopefully playing Cupid to getting different silos of science, the walls breaking down and getting them collaborating and, and inspiring people with how characters come to life and how emotions can bloom in places they didn't think would happen at all. And then realizing not only can it happen, but your science will exponentially increase the experience of it. Um, so it can be a, a, a beautiful breakthrough with, with that. But for all of that, you know, it's 99% uh, of it is just confidential and top secret. And as far as applause on the global scene, there, there's none until, you know, certain things are unveiled and, and then you can be allowed to speak about it. But, and so they, that was a rare case where they created a creative sandbox of innovation where I felt absolutely beautifully at home in that environment. But for most of the intervening time, for like the first 17 shows that I did for the parks, I out of choice stayed independent contractor um, because I wanted to be sure that I didn't just become part of a system because I felt like the buzzer beaters aren't given to somebody that's in the system. Usually it's like the outsider, the fresh eye, the person who's like, I have the deep experience to be called part of the Disney family. Um, and, you know, it goes back far and it intersects directly with some of the veterans. Um, but I've also had time out just trying experiments outside of Disney and they've been very tolerant of that. And I think more times they called on me to, because I was outside and, but a kindred soul and available. And that if I had just been on staff, I'm not sure that the Katzenberg would have called me and said, hey, here's a thing that I, I, I hate it now and I need to love it by Friday, do something. You know, I think because you're being thought of as the fresh eye and a problem solver, it helps with that. So, but believe me, there was a lot of downtime with that and a lot of exploring and a lot of not knowing what's going to happen next, but it, but sort of in my heart, I always felt more satisfaction knowing that, well, whatever it is, once I take it, it's something that I will have chosen to do because I think it matters to the audience and it matters to me and it carries on the tradition. And I just, the last thing I want to do is, and you know, we all have to survive, but I didn't want my habit to be, I have a job. You know, I wanted my habit to be, I'm bringing a character to life. I'm, you know, the audience is going to feel this thing. It's like two years from now when this opens, the audience is going to feel this when it happens. You know, that, that's what I'm latching onto. Not like, what is, what, what bills do I have to pay right now? And where's my job to fill that? It's like, so there were a lot of scrambling and lean times and everything. And then things happen and then it's between times. And, um, and occasionally you get given a gift that's both. Like I was, um, uh, uh, Ross and Janice Bagdasarian called me and they said, can you write an episode of The Chipmunks? And, and it's funny, uh, Chase Pritchard, uh, I was talking to him on, on Facebook, he and some of his buddies, we did a, a Zoom. And one of them brought up like, dude, you did a, you wrote a Chipmunks episode? What? And I said, well, it was a special case. They got in touch with me and said, we have a few shows that we think are important for children and families to, to experience that the network would never pay for. Mm 
They just think it's too risky. And would you write one of our specialty episodes? And they called me in and they went through a number of subjects. And one of them was the death of a pet, uh, a kitten that's killed. And I had just had a kitten killed in the street out in front. It was our, our pet, Nikki. <laughs> and I just said, well, I won't do that one. And we went on to other things. And then it just, I couldn't get it off my mind. And I called them the next morning and I said, it's, that's the only one I can write. So we won a humanitas award for that. Oh. But, but you know, it's, that's one of those things where it was like, that wasn't a, that wasn't like a big ambitious theme park thing. It was a chipmunks episode, which could be seen as more of a regular position, but it was a rare thing. They called me in for specialty stories and it was the one that I, avoided but in my heart was the only one that I was so emotionally connected to viscerally connected to that I went I will I will never be able to forgive myself if I don't write this because it's important for people to get through these emotions so you know sometimes sometimes the thing that pays the bills is also if you can find that reason to care in it um, and it works so be ready to improvise <laughs> One of the great tools uh, and skills that you've cultivated over the years. Matt, I want to just make sure we get one final question in and then uh, clearly we have quite a bit more for our next time with you whenever we get scheduled, which I'm really excited about. Um, I, I knew this was going to be a bounty of remarkable, incredible, uh, you know, amazing things to discuss. So we'll, we'll rather than rush through, we'll so right. many other aspects of your career and your creative efforts for, for another time. But Matt, if we've got one more question. Yeah, I'm going to go back to uh, these questions from the Brave Little Toaster. Um, JB's uh, asking, would you be interested in directing a live action Brave Little Toaster? I actually wrote a story for a live action CG combination Brave Little Toaster sequel that I've never seen the two sequels. Um, you know, I, I just, as a matter of principle, <laughs> did not, did not see, see them. Um, I've heard from other people though, that, that by and large, people are more connected to the original. Uh, so Yair Landau, who was a producer at Sony and did everything from the beginning of Sony animation to Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs. He got in touch with me and said, uh, you know, I would love to back a proper toaster sequel. And he said, I, I think, I would be crazy if I didn't go back to the director of the first one because over time, the first one has become more cherished and in my opinion. And so why would I go anywhere else except back to you and whoever you deem the core team to, to put that together. So I actually did write a story, which I have um, that would pick up right where the, our animated original left off with college. And um, I have a, a blind side to the, to sequels, so I would not be influenced them because I have not seen them. Um, it's my own uh, story, and it would be live action animation was what it was supposed to be. And Yair was doing an innovative process uh, with his group Mass Animation, where he invited anybody who wanted to participate around the world to try animating things. And he would give, uh, um, I think Autodesk gave a user friendly version of Maya to people. Um, he would have them look through story wheels of things and any particular sequence that caught somebody's fancy and particular shots, they could just get in touch through Facebook and go, I'd like to try this scene of this character in this shot. He was doing a, a, a short. And then he would give them the stuff for free. And they, people would rank each other's scenes every week. And there was the company giving out free computers every week with whoever would be voted with the highest ranking scene that week. Uh, so it was a real, celebratory sort of particip participation. And then he had high level uh, veterans that were giving notes on it. So it was really like a master class course. So um, I helped him on the second one where I would be dealing with somebody who had years and years of animation experience that might be in Kansas. I might be doing a novice who's never done animation before that's in Tokyo. And I don't know their age, they're, they're seniors, they're kids, they're whatever. And, uh, but we would just, shepherd potential along until there would be sort of a winner scene that would happen 
and Yara would collect those and then had an in-house group that would sort of stitch them together, but they would get credit, they'd get paid then if it went into the film. The people that didn't get theirs in the film still got free tutelage, free software experience, uh, you know, at a pretty high level. So that, that was something he had already tried and I thought it was very brave. So I wanted to make at least a portion of the Toaster sequel open to that kind of fan participation of people who grew up with Toaster, it's on their minds, they want to dive in and participate too. Um, and then I had one sequence that was fun that was just a bunch of crazy stylizations of the characters that I would hand to two other filmmakers and have them participate as well. And uh, so yes, it's uh, all of that hit a huge speed bump because there is, there was and still is a giant legal problem around the property. Um, and uh, I think Waterman and company bought it secretly out from under us. They outbid Yair in secret bids, oh, wow. took it away from us. Um, they were not interested at all in having the original director involved. Um, then I heard that that died out and I, I don't know what's happening with it now, except that there were bankruptcies and legal problems and it, evidently rights being sold that were not legal because the rights didn't belong to the person who sold them. Mm. And so there is a tangled knot. Yeah. If it is ever untangled, and if I happen to be in the position, uh, yes, I absolutely am looking forward to a heartfelt, funny uh, adventure with these characters in live action and CG. Uh, and it's on my agenda. It's in my idea box, which is always full. <laughs> No doubt. Well, we are grateful for that. Um, Jerry, what a delight and what a joy and what a mind <laughs> expanding experience getting to talk with you. Thank you for, I think, conveying openly just, you know, the, the experiences you've had in embracing the unknown and, and really demonstrating in such strong, eloquent ways the importance of that and to be comfortable in that and, and particularly for creatives uh, and um, it's never an easy thing especially in our current times but thank you for for sharing it's tough right now but i but i would but i would just make a note that as i was doing independent contractor work and and telecommuting which now we're we're used to doing that now there were certain times where that became a more productive environment and we got even more accomplished because we weren't forcing people to move from Cincinnati to LA and get in a certain brick and mortar facility. And we just got, in some cases, a lot of creativity bloomed uh, in ways that changed people's lives. They had one person entirely leave the studio they were at and go to a different studio because of the awakening they felt on our project, which was all moonlighting via this, these processes and and it was but it was before we had to it was just i was choosing to do it now we sort of have to do it but in the past i've seen it be a really productive environment and of course mindy you know we we talked about ar vr and ai and immersive space and changing the world and so those are future conversations but i think right now the telecommuting we're feeling is a preamble to some gigantic and what could be positive and exciting changes for the world yeah, well, let us <laughs> embrace this, this brave unknown, but to embrace it beautifully. So grateful for that. Thank you. Can't wait for our next conversation because we have some incredible content to go into. My gosh, that you are on the bleeding edge of AR and uh, just sort of the direction of this fuzzy horizon ahead. You are well in advance of that. And so I'm very excited. We will continue our conversation. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Jerry, so much for spending time and, and casting a light on an area that is somewhat unknown to a number of folks. Thank you so much for spending time, Jerry. A great joy. Looking forward to our next conversation. Me too, Mindy. Thank you so much. And thanks to Tina and CTN and behind the scenes to Matt and Alicia. Take good care. Be well. We'll see you next time.